Welcome to our presentation entitled Prescription Opioids Are Our Painkillers Killing Our Patients? I'm Peter Kreckel. I'm a busy retail pharmacist at Thompson Pharmacy in Broad Avenue, a small little neighborhood drugstore, kind of in Center City, Altoona, Pennsylvania. Also, I'm an adjunct assistant professor of pharmacology at St. Francis University in Loretto, Pennsylvania. There I teach all of the pharmacology to the physician assistant science students. Let's talk about our learning objectives. We're going to identify United States laws that pertain to the approval of drugs and their enforcement. We're going to outline the history of drugs with the potential for abuse and strategies for dealing with abuse potential. And finally, we'll describe the role of the pharmacist and the drug wholesaler in the prevention of drug abuse, as well as the profession's role in deterring diversion. We're going to try to figure out how we got here from there. Let's talk a little bit about this epidemic of drug abuse in the United States. Always striving to be number one, us Americans are, and we are number one when it comes to drug abuse, especially with respect to opioids. The United States of America comprises less than 5% of the world's population, but Americans consume 80% of the global opioid supply. The Americans consume 99% of the world's hydrocodone supply, and the Americans consume 66% of the entire world's illegal drugs. And I have that source cited on this slide for you. Not that I'm an international traveler, but when I do go abroad occasionally, I like to talk to retail pharmacists. And the past summer we were in Italy, at Assisi, Italy, talking to a pharmacist. And he told me that he filled three oxycodone prescriptions back in 2012. And he said to me, oxycodone is for big pain. Why do you give it out so much in America? I asked him in a similar scenario, if you had a patient with a wisdom teeth extraction, all four molars removed, what would you manage that pain with? And the pharmacist smiled and held up a box of ibuprofen 400 and said, that's all you need for wisdom tooth extraction. I'm also uh, friends with a physician in India, and he told me that ibuprofen works well for pain management. We don't have oxycodone or hydrocodone, but we do reserve morphine for our cancer patients. So the United States is very good at consuming large amounts of opioids, and when you travel abroad, you'll find that ibuprofen is the go-to drug for most pain management situations, unless, of course, it's cancer pain. Let's look at many of the laws that govern our practice. We'll start out with the FDA Act of 1906, the FDC Act of 1938, the Kefauver Harris Amendments of 1962, and finally the Controlled Substance Act of 1970. Well, back when we had Teddy Roosevelt as our president, the Food and Drug Act of 1906 passed, and this law prohibited misbranding and adul adulterated foods, drinks, and drugs in the interstate commerce, and it was enforced by the Bureau of Chemistry in the Department of Agriculture. This is before the FDA was even around. The Bureau became the Food and Drug Administration in 1930. There was no requirement that any information be submitted to the FDA before marketing, and the law required only the drugs meet standards of strength and purity. Basically, the law, the Food and Drug Act of 1906, said whatever was on the label had to be in the bottle. If you had a sulfa drug on the label, there had to be a sulfa drug in the bottle. Hard to believe, but before that, you could put anything in the bottle and label it with anything you liked. Many of us pharmacists are familiar with the sulfonilamide tragedy of 1938, and that caused the Federal Food, Drug, and Cosmetic Act of 1938. The elixir of sulfonilamide tragedy, the S.C. Massengill Company in Bristol, Tennessee, was marketing uh, sulfa, and they saw this need to make it in a liquid form. So what they did is they dissolved it in a chemical that's relative to antifreeze, that we now use in our automobiles. 107 people died from that. So for the first time, the Federal 
Food, Drug, and Cosmetic Act required that a drug had to be safe before it was marketed. It means you can't kill or hurt anybody by the medications, and that's all that was required by the Federal Food, Drug, and Cosmetic Act of 1938. Continuing our journey through these United States laws, we had the Kefauver Harris Drug Amendments of 1962. In October of 1962, Congress passed amendments to the Federal FDNC Act. Before marketing a drug, firms had to prove not only that these drugs were safe, but they also had to provide some evidence of effectiveness. Not only did we have to show that what was ever in the bottle was on the label, and that drug wouldn't kill you. Then in 1962, this act required you to have efficacy behind the drugs. Drug companies had to have FDA approval before marketing of a drug. Well, now that the drugs match the labels and the drugs weren't going to kill you and the drugs are efficacious, we have the Controlled Substance Act then of 1970, which is going to put into effect a lot of rules that govern our practice today. What it did is divided those drugs with abuse potential into certain categories or schedules as we refer to them in any one of five schedules based on the potential for abuse and the legitimacy of its medical need. So considerations for drug schedulings, the drug's actual or relative abuse potential. As we know, the lower number in the schedule, the more potential for abuse. Scientific evidence of the drug's pharmacological effects. The scope, the duration, and significance of abuse, as well as whether the substance is an immediate precursor of a substance that's already controlled. So if you developed yet another precursor similar to that, what schedule is it going to be in based on its relatives, pharmacologically speaking? Of all of the statements in the Controlled Substance Act, this one needs to be engraved and etched into our brains. It comes from Section 1306.04, the purpose of issue of prescription. A prescription for a controlled substance to be effective must be issued for a legitimate medical purpose by an individual practitioner acting in the usual course of his professional practice. So that in and of itself tells us veterinarians are not going to be allowed to write for uh, narcotics for family members, for example. It has to be for veterinarian use. The responsibility of the proper prescribing and dispensing of controlled substances rests upon the prescribing practitioner. But the part that we need to remember is what I have bolded on this slide. A corresponding responsibility rests with the pharmacist who fills the prescription. According to section 1306.04, we have a corresponding responsibility filling these controlled substances as much as the prescribing practitioner does. That's something we have to keep in mind, and that's been the law since the Controlled Substance Act was passed. Let's talk a little bit about the history of the Drug Enforcement Agency. Prior to 1973, several agencies had drug enforcement responsibilities. It wasn't until July of 1973 the DEA was created by an executive order signed by then-President Richard M. Nixon. The purpose of the DEA was to create a single federal agency to consolidate and coordinate the government's drug control activities. They brought it all under one office, one roof, essentially, the enforcement of these drug laws. Let's take a quick review of the DEA schedules. Well, Schedule 1 is something, unless we're involved in research, uh, we'll never see these drugs. Uh, in our pharmacies. They have the highest abuse potential, the high physical dependence, high psychological dependence, and the examples of this is going to be marijuana, LSD, those drugs that are considered to be street drugs. Obviously no refills and they can't be phoned in, but Schedule 2 has a high abuse potential, a high physical dependence, and Examples of this are going to be our oxycodone, amphetamine, methadone, the real potent opioids, 
as well as the stimulants in the amphetamine class, of course. Uh, no refills on these drugs, and they may not be phoned in. Occasionally, some laws do allow faxing for hospice patients. And then Schedule 3 and 4, pretty similar as far as the legality goes. Uh, five refills expires in six months, and we as pharmacists can affect phones, faxes, or original prescriptions. One of the biggest problems we're seeing now is overdose. And at one time, it was stereotypically thought of that uh, the men were doing most of the overdosing. But now we're finding it to be a woman's problem. About 18 women die every day of a prescription painkiller overdose in the United States. More than 6,600 deaths in 2010. Prescription painkiller overdoses are an underrecognized and growing problem for our female population. More than five times as many women died from prescription painkiller overdoses in 2010 than just 10 years earlier in 1999. So in that one decade period, we had a five-fold increase in women overdosing from opioids. Women between the ages of 25 and 54 are more likely than other age groups to go to the emergency department from prescription painkiller misuse or abuse. Women ages 45 to 54 have the highest risk of dying from a prescription painkiller overdose. So it's not so much this young people diseases we're thinking. We're seeing women age 45 to 54 having the highest risk of death from opioid overdose. The news gets worse. Here are some real numbers that I got from the CDC for your consideration. 48,000 women died of prescription painkiller overdose between 1999 and 2010 in the United States. There has been a 400% increase in overdoses in women since 1999 compared to 265% increase among men. Women are really rapidly catching up. And the number 30, for every woman who dies of a prescription painkiller overdose, 30 go to the emergency department for a painkiller misuse or abuse. The statistics are scary indeed. This next slide shows us just the huge increase in opioid prescriptions dispensed by retail pharmacies. I'm a rather experienced pharmacist. I graduated from Pitts Pharmacy School in 1981 and have practiced independent retail pharmacy for all 30 plus years in my career. And I think anyone with that level of experience that I have has seen just a huge and dramatic increase in opioid prescriptions. This slide shows us uh, the number of prescriptions in millions. In 1991, we were filling about 76 million prescriptions and now we're up to 219 million prescriptions, a three-fold increase in that 20-year period we've seen in opioid use. I remember early in my career, you know, 30 Percocet was a big prescription that really caught your attention, and my heavens, if you saw Percocet written for 60 of them, that was really something worth keeping your eyes peeled for, and today, 60 Percocet goes out the door like it was nothing. So it is amazing how we pharmacists after so many years have become almost callous to the effect of dispensing the quantities as well as the number of prescriptions of opioids. Let's take a look at the economic costs. It's uh, generating $72.5 billion in health care costs. Opioid abusers generate on average annual direct health care costs 8.7 times higher than non-abusers, almost a nine times increase in health care costs from people abusing opioids versus those who do not abuse opioids. Well, let's take a look at some of these opioids. This next slide is going to show us the equal analgesic doses. And there are lots of references and, and slides available. And you might see some numbers, just slightly different. 
But overall, uh, in compiling this list using different resources, this seems to be uh, pretty accurate as far as potency and uh, doses in milligrams. Uh, when we look at morphine and give it a relative potency of one, the oral morphine, then we'll see IV or IM morphine is about three times more potent milligram per milligram. Uh, oxycodone is about twice as potent. Opana or oxymorphone is about three times more potent. Diamorphine or heroin is four to five times more potent per milligram. Hydromorphone is about five times more potent than Dilaudid. Uh, hydrocodone or Lortab is about milligram per milligram as potent. Uh, fentanyl is 50 to 100 times more potent milligram per milligram. Methadone in the acute phase, the first time the patient uh, gets it, it's about three to four times more potent. And uh, methadone for chronic administration, milligram per milligram is about seven times more potent. And we're going to talk about methadone acute versus chronic in a couple slides and uh, see what is so uh, complicated with methadone dosing. This next slide is going to show euphoria versus street value. And not only does the potency of the drug affect its street value, but also its potential to cause euphoria or that buzz or that high is what really drives street value. The top seat on the street value list is no surprise to a seasoned pharmacist is Dilaudid or Hydromorphone, a drug that was well sought after um, in the early 80s. Uh, this day and age, we don't see a whole lot of Dilaudid, but it does have the highest euphoria potential. And its street value is about $10 a milligram, so it'd be about $100 for 10 milligrams. These prices are coming to us from central Pennsylvania. We're a rural area, and one of the local DEA agents assisted me with uh, these street values. I also talked to some agents from the Pennsylvania Attorney General's office, and these are pretty average values. Where you live, where you work and practice, these values are going to vary. But uh, just for comparison's sake, these are central Pennsylvania's values. Fentanyl is about $50 per 50 microgram patch. Oxycodone is about a dollar per milligram. Oxymorphone or Opana is about a dollar a milligram. Morphine is about a dollar a milligram, as is hydrocodone. So you're seeing that benchmark of about a buck a milligram for the most common opioids uh, that we're dispensing. Tramadol doesn't have a lot of street value, about um, really a dollar a tablet's all you're going to see the Tramadol 54. And methadone is about five dollars a tablet. It doesn't have a lot of street value. Although methadone has the potency, as we've discussed already, it's because of its lack of potential to cause euphoria. Methadone is not really sought after on the street, unless, of course, they're just trying to get through some craving until they can get the really good stuff. This next slide is a slide of the euphoria versus street value, and we can see Dilaudid sits at the top, followed by fentanyl, and oxycodone, oxymorphone, morphine, uh, oxycodone acetaminophen, hydrocodone acetaminophen, tramadol, and then of course methadone. So we can see methadone is on the bottom of the list for euphoria, and it happens to be on the bottom of the list for street value as well. Well, let's talk about methadone uh, the history of it, first of all, is it was developed in Germany in 1937. It was brought to the United States about 10 years later by Eli Lilly and Company. Its brand name was Dolophane. It was a longer acting opioid pain reliever and it causes less euphoria. It is used for the treatment of withdrawal and it's increasingly being used for pain management. And pharmacists can only dispense it for pain relief. And it is an ideal situation if your doctor documents on the prescription that uh, it is being used for pain management. It's just a nice safety feature for us, a little level of comfort for us to know that it is pain management although it is not legally required that the doctor does that. It's good to encourage your doctors to write pain management on all the methadone prescriptions. Unfortunately with methadone is it is a painkiller that is killing our patients. 
Prescription painkiller overdoses were responsible for more than 15,500 deaths in 2009. And while all prescription painkillers have contributed to an increase in overdose death the last decade, methadone. Methadone has played a central role in this epidemic. We're seeing a lot more methadone almost being encouraged by the insurance companies because the OxyContin brand is so expensive and methadone is a longer acting pain reliever and it's so much cheaper as we pharmacists are quite aware of. More than 30% of prescription painkiller deaths involve methadone, even though only 2% of the painkiller prescriptions are for this drug. So methadone comprises about 2% of the painkillers that we dispense, but it's causing 30% of the deaths due to those painkillers. Let's take a look at why methadone causes so many overdose, why it's responsible for 30% of those deaths. We can have methadone deaths occurring in one of three ways. The single overdose, just an overestimated tolerance level or binging abuse, the person just takes a whole lot for their first dose. Accumulation of the drug, which can lead to toxicity, too aggressive therapy. Um, you know, maybe we need to be a lot more uh, slow and patient with instituting methadone therapy. And uh, drug drug interactions can play a huge role as well. We have had six times as many people die of methadone overdose as did 10 years ago. A six fold increase in methadone overdose versus just one decade ago. Well, what causes these challenges with methadone? Well, first of all, uh, we're all familiar with methadone. It has a slower onset of action. The patient starts to feel the swallowed dose about 30 to 45 minutes later. It has a delayed peak action. The greatest effect from a single dose is about two to four hours post-injection, which takes a long time. After they ingest this drug, it might take up to four hours till they start feeling any pain relief at all. Methadone gets stored in the tissues. It's deposited in those tissues over about three to seven days to reach steady state. So if a person is too aggressive, if a prescriber is too aggressive with this drug, we can see toxicity then because it takes about three to seven days for steady state to occur. So during the induction phase, a given dose will have a stronger effect and last longer with each day of ingestion. And finally, as I said earlier on, the drug is cheap. Uh, we know that methadone, probably about $10 is our cost for 100 of the 10 milligram tablets. Um, and many insurance companies prefer to be used versus OxyContin. So it's a more dangerous drug to use, but it's a whole lot cheaper. And a lot of managed care institutions want this drug to be used first. Well, let's talk about heroin. Heroin is, uh, diamorphine is its medical name. So when you say the word heroin, you're throwing a street name around. It was actually a brand name marketed by Bayer. And uh, Bayer came up with this drug in 1895. And yes, they did sell it over the counter. It was hailed as a wonder substance for its ability to wean addicted individuals off of their drug of choice. That's how they promoted it. And remember, it wasn't until in the United States until 1963 that they would have actually had to do any kind of study showing it was effective. So heroin uh, was marketed in the late 1890s uh, by Bayer, the same company that made Bayer aspirin, as a way of treating the terrible pain without exposing people to that horrible drug that was so addictive called morphine. They actually presented this drug as a safer alternative to morphine, if we can believe that. Bayer and company was trying to synthesize from morphine the less addictive codeine and they stumbled on heroin. Uh, heroin is diacetyl morphine and as we know the trouble with morphine is getting it to, uh, to penetrate past that blood-brain barrier. Well the chemists at Bayer found that if they put two diacetyl groups on morphine it made it more lipid soluble. More lipid soluble makes it a whole lot easier to penetrate the blood-brain barrier. It is still used in the United Kingdom for pain management. They're still using it over across the ocean uh, to manage pain yet. Heroin in the United States, though, uh, is 
a Schedule One substance. Uh, we know it's potent. We know it is effective. But because of the potential for abuse, it isn't Schedule One. And some information about heroin from my uh, street people tell they tell me that one pack retails on the street for about twenty dollars a pack, twenty to thirty bucks for a pack in our area. Now I'm in a little. Um, urban area in central Pennsylvania. Uh, they tell me if you go to Pittsburgh or Philadelphia in the cities, it can be as low as 4 to $8 a pack. In the rural areas up north of here, it'll retail on the streets for as much as $50. There are 10 packs to what they call a bundle, and one brick of heroin is about 50 packs, and the term they use are glassines, those thin bags um, that the heroin is packaged in. So the price of heroin just really depends on where you are. So you can see why these drug peddlers are so happy to move into these smaller urban areas like Altoona or State College in, in my area or the little urban areas where you may be living or the rural areas are also becoming hit with this epidemic just because the money's better. There's less competition. And if you can sell a glass scene of heroin for $50 in Ridgeway, Pennsylvania, why would you sell it for $8 a pack in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania? Simple economics. That's what's driving this. Oxycodone history. Oxycodone was also developed in Germany in 1916 during World War I, and it came to the United States in 1939. Oxycodone uh, suspended release, the OxyContin, became available in 1996, and just five years later, OxyContin became the number one pain reliever in the United States. In 2010, a new preparation was finally released, and it's the matrix that the narcotic is presented in. It contains a substance that makes the pill turn to a gluey resin, so it's very difficult to snort or to inject. The addicts, as many of us pharmacists know, uh, do not like the new OxyContin. They can inject this form of OxyContin, and it has greatly lowered the street value of this drug. It has lowered it so much that many of the addicts are returning back to heroin. This article that I'm citing from the New England Journal of Medicine 2012 uh, tells us that the selection of OxyContin as the primary drug of abuse decreased from 35.6% of respondents before the release of the abuse deterrent formulation to just 12.8% 21 months later. After that reformulation in less than two years, we saw it go from 36 down to 12%. Only one third as many people are abusing OxyContin now as they were before that new formulation was developed. So that has been very effective by Purdue Frederick, that new matrix. Simultaneously, the selection of hydrocodone and other oxycodone agents increased slightly, whereas the other opioids, including fentanyl, the real high potent fentanyl, and hydromorphone selection rose markedly. That jumped from 20% to 32%, kind of filling that void that the OxyContin created. Of all opioids used to get high in the past 30 days, at least once OxyContin fell from 47% down to 30%, where we saw a doubling of heroin use. Now, some of the addicts tell me that they can still uh, abuse OxyContin, and what they do is they take a bolt, a bolt like uh, you buy at the hardware store, like a four-inch bolt, and they scrape the coating off with the bolt, and they shave it off into a little pile, then they heat it, and then they inject it. So... I've not, of course, had any experience seeing that done, but they tell me that there are ways that the addicts are trying to get around that coating, and uh, by bolting it seems to be what some of them are doing. As I said, they jumped back to oxymorphone or opana. That became the drug of choice when OxyContin was reformulated in 2010. That also was developed in Germany in 1914. It was introduced in the United States in 1955 by Endo Pharmaceuticals under the brand name of Numorphan. Opana was introduced as an oral form in 2006. 
Opana ER was changed to the intact platform of extended release and abuse deterrent in 2012. So the Endo company, they switched uh, delivery systems as well. It's called the Intac uh, platform, and uh, that's less likely to be abused as well. Okay, so they're moving now to hydrocodone, which we all know is in Schedule 3. And uh, the DEA Diversion Drug Trend Report identifies hydrocodone as the most commonly diverted and abused controlled pharmaceutical in the United States. It's number one. As we all know, there's multiple strengths of the hydrocodone. It generally comes as 2.5, 500, 7.5, and uh, 10 milligram strengths. But what varies is the amount of acetaminophen. Uh, brand names vary on acetaminophen levels anywhere from uh, 300 milligrams to 325 milligrams, now to 750 milligrams is the top. We'll probably see those higher strengths of acetaminophen uh, dropping off. Liver failure, acetaminophen overdose accounts for 46% of the acute liver failure, and that's why we're seeing a drop in the acetaminophen levels in these uh, particular products. Uh, we pharmacists take a great deal of comfort knowing that uh, our patients, if they take too much uh, Vicodin ES, say for, to mention a brand name so that we can appreciate the level of acetaminophen. We'll say, well, you're going to knock out your liver if you take more than four a day of the Vicodin ES. Uh, we take a lot of comfort in knowing that acetaminophen's in there, and that's a good deterrent, so we think. Don't get too comfortable, pharmacists, with that acetaminophen in the hydrocodone uh, is providing uh, deterrents for our opioid patients. They can easily remove the acetaminophen with stuff that we all have in our kitchens. Uh, it's called cold water extractions. As we remember from medicinal chemistry back in pharmacy school, opioids are all soluble in water. Acetaminophen is not water soluble. And acetaminophen is even less water soluble in cold water, anywhere around 40 degrees. So you can extract the hydrocodone from the acetaminophen to avoid liver damage. And I'll show you on the next slide how we do that. Without any complicated chemistry equipment, we can easily remove acetaminophen from either the Endoset or the Vicodin or the Lortabs. What you do is you crush the opiate acetaminophen product into a fine powder. Uh, my street people tell me what they do is they use Ziploc bags and they say use the brand ones so they don't break. I'm not endorsing any particular Ziploc bag. I'm just telling you they say the heavier ones uh, won't break open and spill that precious powder over the kitchen counter. And you use a rolling pin or a hammer, but a rolling pin will get you better consistency. Or if you want to, you know, use a mortar and pestle, pick one of those up or even a coffee grinder will get you your results even faster. You'll dissolve the pill in warm water, not too hot water, but warm water about 100 degrees, and you stir it for a few minutes, and ideally you want to use at least two milliliters per tablet. You're going to stir it up and make a slurry, and then you're going to put it in the refrigerator. You're going to chill the solution and don't let it freeze. Now, my street people tell me if you're in a real hurry, you can put it in the freezer. You just have to watch it. Don't let it freeze because it'll uh, ruin your batch. So you can either put it in the refrigerator if you're a patient uh, person, or you can put it in the freezer. Just be sure you're watching it. And you'll chill the solution, and then at around 40 degrees, that acetaminophen just kind of drops right out, lays on the bottom, and then on the top you're left with a nice solution of opioid. Some will decant the solution and drink it that way, or you can filter it with a coffee filter. The solution is very, very bitter, so some will say use Kool-Aid, or I guess if you're health conscious, you could use Crystal Light uh, to get some flavoring. They say lemon tastes a little better than the other ones. You can add the flavoring to it, and then you drink it, and you're drinking pure opioid.
Again, all of this information initially uh, was given to me by one of my street people. He said to me, Pete, I know you pharmacists have a lot of comfort uh, dispensing uh, lower tab. He said, but have you heard of cold water extraction? And I never did. So I did, of course, listen to him, came home, looked it up, and uh, found it is a rather easy process to remove and extract that acetaminophen from those combination tablets. And if you noticed here, I didn't say Erlenmeyer flask or uh, electronic balance or anything. It's all stuff that we could go right out to our kitchens now and get. Another challenge we have as pharmacists is the uh, the maintenance of these uh, individuals that are addicted to opioids. And uh, the data 2000 is the Children's Health Act of 2000. Uh, this is a subsection, uh, section 3502. And this act permits physicians who meet certain qualifications to treat opioid addiction with Schedule 3, 4, and 5 narcotic medications that have been specifically approved by the FDA for that indication. Note I said specifically approved. So if a person is trained under this data 2000 to administer opioids for people to treat their addiction, they cannot use drugs like Dilaudid or hydrocodone to do that. They can only use drugs that are approved by the FDA for that opioid maintenance, and we all know what the one is. Such medications may be prescribed and dispensed by these waived physicians in treatment settings other than that traditional opioid treatment program, a methadone clinic uh, in that setting. So they can treat these patients in their office. And Suboxone is the first narcotic drug that's available under the DATA Act of 2000 for the treatment of opiate dependence that can be prescribed in the doctor's office. They do not need to go to a specific methadone clinic for this drug. As we all know, it can be prescribed in the comfort of the doctor's office. So the doctor can go into one examining room and take care of a person uh, with tachycardia go to the next room and take care of a patient with pneumonia and go to the next room and take care of a patient um, that is addicted to drugs and prescribed Suboxone. It can be part of his regular retail clinic. Because there are limited numbers of methadone clinics, this act provides more patients the opportunity to access treatments. Let's talk a little bit about Suboxone, buprenorphine and naloxone. The tablets were developed to be abuse proof because the naloxone in those blocks the effects of the opioid if the abusers tried to administer it by injection. And how that works is naloxone is a mu opioid antagonist. Uh, it has a high first pass metabolism and low sublingual bioavailability. It's included in, with the buprenorphine to deter its IV use. So if a person crushes this up and tries to mainline it, they're not going to get the opioids effect. The naloxone gets in there and blocks the effect. And it seems less likely to cause overdose. Uh, buprenorphine is not picked up by the, root, the routine opioid urine screens. You do have to specifically uh, request to see it. And because it's only a partial agonist and because it has a ceiling effect, uh, the abuse potential for buprenorphine is somewhat limited. Uh, you take a lot of it, you're not going to get any higher. So we, the potential to abuse it just really isn't there. It also seems to cause less respiratory depression in an overdose than any of the full mu agonists. So uh, buprenorphine has a long duration of action, as we know. Uh, it causes less respiratory depression. Um, we can ad really administer it once or twice a day at the most, and it's less likely to cause those withdrawal symptoms when it's stopped. So it is a drug that has a real nice niche for treatment of uh, opiate dependency. Let's discuss the pharmacist's role in preventing diversion. Uh, as we said earlier on, we have a responsibility to prevent diversion. We have a, as much of a responsibility as the prescriber does who writes that prescription. So what can we pharmacists do to help prevent uh, this epidemic of drug diversion? 
Ideally, we want to establish relationships with our patients. Let's get to talk to them a little bit, find out their story, find out why they're taking these medications. Always best to establish a relationship with the prescribers. Give them a phone call if anything sounds suspicious. Be familiar with the DEA red flags. Train your staff to be aware of those red flags and look for patterns. Look for patients and look for the prescribers and see if you can pick up any patterns that might lead you to believe that we are having some potential for drug diversion. We are finding now that not only pharmacists, but the wholesalers are becoming targets uh, for the DEA. I have here a list of DEA registrants, and this is based on the number of DEA numbers that are given for those particular disciplines. There are over 1,021,000 physicians that are registered with the DEA that could prescribe opioids. Okay, pharmacies, there's about 65,000 of us that are registered with the DEA. Hospitals and clinics, we've got about 16,000. We have about 8,000 researchers. Pharmaceutical distributors, there's 823. There's pharmaceutical manufacturers, 515. There's importers and exporters, 362. And what we call full-line wholesalers, there's about 40. And these are those drug companies that virtually anyone can buy from and not to endorse any of them but it's that wholesaler that you use that many of us are buying their narcotics from that any wholesaler can so i work for an independent pharmacist as an independent pharmacist for thompson pharmacy i can order say from mckesson or america amerisource or value drug. Those are full line wholesalers. And that's who the DEA is really paying close attention to because there's less of them. So what is expected from the wholesalers? And I have to give a special thank you to Greg Drew. Greg Drew is the president of Value Drug. And Value Drug is a, a rather smaller wholesaler here in central Pennsylvania. Uh, they're growing exponentially every year. And they're based out of Altoona, Pennsylvania, where I practice. It is focuses independent pharmacies. And uh, Greg gave me a lot of information as far as what the wholesaler's responsibility is. I've also talked to some people from uh, Rochester Pharmaceuticals up in uh, upstate New York, and they've pretty much confirmed this as well. The wholesaler has to have a due diligence plan uh, to show that they are paying attention to anything that might uh, lead them to suspect diversion. They track our purchases as percentages and around 20% is pretty much what they're going to tolerate. Our wholesaler says that their accounts average 15 to 17% of the opioids uh, in relationship to the rest of the stuff you buy. Uh, they track the dollar volume of sales, and they're tracking actually the number of tablets of sales. So uh, we would think 100 Oxycontin 80, knowing that that's into the $1,200 to $1,400 range per hundred. And then we look also at, say, um, generic Percocet. Well, the dollar volume is different, obviously, of those, but they're also tracking the number of tablets, and that's important to remember as well. And they also are tracking drug categories as well. They're watching Soma. They're watching or carisoprodol, they're watching Lortab, hydrocodone, and they're also watching Oxycontin and Oxycodone. Our wholesaler has allocation numbers uh, that are pretty much set up for each pharmacy based on previous purchases. And they also have a 29-day rolling allocation. So for example, if I see a shortage is coming up with oxycodone acetaminophen 10 325 and i say uh you know i use about 300 of those a week i want to buy 3000 of them so i don't run out by the end of the year i'm not going to be able to do that because that's going to exceed both my daily allocation and my 29 day rolling allocation so from a business perspective we might want to buy a whole lot of a drug that we know the price is going to increase we might not be able to do that with a lot of the opioids because of that daily allocation as well as the 29 day rolling allocation 
okay, what happens when I fill out my 222 to purchase narcotics or I fill out my CSOS? Well, first of all, the wholesaler reports back to the manufacturer as to who they sold the drug to. So the manufacturer has incentives for reporting. For example, if we buy opioid A and it's sold to the pharmacy for $30 a hundred, the wholesaler pays 50 bucks a hundred for that. So when the wholesaler reports back to the manufacturer, then they get their $20 rebate back. So they have to report directly back. It's a huge financial incentive for them to report back. This allows then the manufacturer to track and report any pharmacies who are buying opioids from multiple wholesalers. So let's go back to my scenario of the uh, oxycodone acetaminophen 10325, and I say, uh, I'm using 300 a week and I wanna buy 3,000. Well, I know what I'll do. I'll buy 1,000 from Value and I'll buy 1,000 from McKesson and I'll buy 1,000 from Rochester and I'll buy 1,000 from Kinray. What happens is, even if I do that, these manufacturers will get the report from those individual wholesalers that uh, Thompson Pharmacy Broad Avenue bought a thousand from me, a thousand from me, a thousand from me, and a thousand from me. So the manufacturers are already tracking opioids as well as your wholesaler is doing it. There's a lot of layers of tracking all this, all thanks to our computer systems. So what happens when you are exceeding this 29-day rolling period? Uh, somebody's going to come to visit you, and it's going to be the guy from the wholesaler. Um, they're called site visits, and they're going to come, and they're going to come to talk to you, and they're looking for data such as patients outside the pharmacy's normal trade area or physicians outside of the normal trade area. Now, we all know we do a great job as pharmacists, you know, and I think I do a, a very good job for Thompson Pharmacy, and we all know uh, we work hard and we're well-respected in the community. I can understand people from Altoona maybe flocking to my pharmacy, but seriously, are they going to drive two and a half hours from Pittsburgh because I am that good of a retail pharmacist? Hardly the case. So we need to uh, be paying attention to these patients who are outside of our trade area or physicians outside of our normal trade area. Yes, if they're going to the Hillman Cancer Center in Pittsburgh and bringing an oxycodone prescription to me, that makes sense. But make sure that the patients live locally and they're getting their other medications at your store. And yes, I will not fill prescriptions for patients that only want me to fill their opioids because they can go to the big box retailer and get their $4 prescriptions. Uh, I will not do that because I don't want to look suspicious. Pharmacists have to be able to show, is that drug being used for that patient? Does that patient have a legitimate medical condition? No, we're not privileged to the diagnosis. I realize that. But we need to at least make some attempt uh, that these aren't being diverted. And is that drug not being used for diversion? And if the answer to any one of these above points uh, is no... Let's not fill the prescription. I always tell my wife, I said, at the end of the day, honey, 2% of our patients give us 98% of our headaches. So what are our challenges as retail pharmacists? We're working for for-profit companies. Uh, Thompson Pharmacy needs to make a profit to stay in business, as does CVS and Rite Aid, Rite Aid and every other drugstore on every other counter. Needs to make a profit. Uh, another problem that we have is there are no published ceilings on opioids. You can't find in the literature what an excessive dose of an opioid is. You can't show me anywhere that it's going to say, well, you shouldn't exceed more than 320 milligrams of oxycodone in a day. It's not published. My third concern is what is an unreasonable dose if the insurance companies reimburse the pharmacist. If you transmit a prescription for 360 oxycodone 30 milligrams and the DEA agent says that's an unreasonable dose, but yet the clinical pharmacist at the insurance company approves it, it's hardly an unreasonable dose. These insurance companies won't pay for Cymbalta, for example, Deloxetine or Lyrica, but they'll pay for 360 tablets of oxycodone 30 milligrams. 
I take comfort in transmitting a claim to insurance company that it gets adjudicated positively. I would have to say it can't be an unreasonable dose if insurance companies, as difficult as they are to work with, approve these drugs. And finally, Insurance companies prefer to pay for oxycodone immediate release than the expense of sustained release. And we know that oxycodone immediate release has a higher abuse potential because it can be crushed, mainlined, and snorted. And I, as a pharmacist, appreciate that. But the truth of the matter is the insurance companies prefer that to be dispensed because it's cheaper. As I previously stated, uh, we need to pay attention to the DEA red flags and make sure our patients are comfortable with it. And you know, it's not really unreasonable to print these out and hang them out where your patients can read them as well. So some of the DEA red flags that we need to pay particular attention to is, uh, first of all, uh, multiple drugs with multiple mechanisms of action that are highly abused. So particularly, let's watch oxycodone, hydrocodone, alprazolam, and carisoprodol alone or in combinations that are known as cocktails. So when uh, a patient is saying they have osteoarthritis and they're getting oxycodone, we can understand that. What is the purpose of the carisoprodol or the alprazolam for that? So we wanna pay attention to those multiple combinations. If we see ourselves dispensing a high percentage of oxycodone and hydrocodone alprazolam or other highly abused narcotics compared to our non-controlled drugs. As much as our wholesalers and the DEA is paying attention to that, we also need to be paying attention to it as well. Many times it does have a legitimate purpose. Just be able to defend that as well when you get that site visit from your wholesaler. If we're dispensing high volumes of controlled substances, uh, we have to take a look and see why we might be doing that. If we're dispensing the same drugs in the same quantities uh, prescribed by the same prescriber to numerous patients. I had a doctor um, in a small town, maybe about an hour and a half away, that it was incredible because in one afternoon I would see three different prescriptions from three different pr patients all for the same drugs from him. And of course, I refused to fill all three. But it was almost like somebody chartered a bus down there and they all came back at once and uh, ran around to all the local pharmacies to try to get them filled. Another DEA red flag is dispensing to out of area or out of state patients. More DEA red flags that we need to pay attention to uh, significant geographical distances between the patient, the prescriber, and the pharmacy. So if I have a prescriber in Philadelphia, a patient that lives in Bradford as an address, and they come to Altoona, Pennsylvania, covering a distance of well over three or 400 miles between those stops, that just doesn't add up. And anytime you see a triangle rather than a straight line, uh, you got to be suspicious. If we put a pin where the doctor is, a pin where the patient lives, and a pin where your pharmacy is, and that looks more like a triangle than a straight line, time to pay attention to that. Uh, if we dispense to multiple patients with the same last names, it's highly unusual that all five family members are going to have the same cancer or the same musculoskeletal condition. Dispensing to multiple patients with a common street address should be a clue. Uh, close sequential prescription numbers for the same highly diverted drugs prescribed by the same prescriber indicating patients brought prescriptions to the pharmacy at the same time. If you see, you know, four or five oxycodone 30s together in a sequence from the same doctor in different patients, you know, maybe they, seems like they chartered a van or a bus. A patient obtaining uh, controlled substances from multiple practitioners, the doctor shoppers, again, we have to pay very close attention to. 
Some more DEA red flags is a patient receiving antagonistic controlled substances. Uh, for example, uh, depressants and stimulants, uh, maybe some barbiturates and amphetamines given together we want to pay attention to. Or a pain patient who does not receive a mix of the short-acting and long-acting narcotics. And ideally, the way these drugs should be prescribed I kind of compare it to uh, Lantus and Humalog. Uh, you have a basal drug, your long-acting medication, and then the short bursts of uh, op opioid for the breakthrough moments. So if a person is, say, on Opana or OxyContin, those brand names that are long-acting, or even, say, a methadone, if a person's well titrated, can be your long-term pain reliever, and then maybe a short blast for the breakthrough pain. And ideally, they should not be using more than two breakthrough doses a day without ramping up that basal opioid. So a patient uh, seeking early prescription refills when they should have medication remaining from a prior dispensing or a patient obtaining prescriptions for large quantities and high doses. And as we talked about earlier on, if we could only have a published ceiling for these opioids, we could say what a high dose is. And right now, it's very, very difficult. Now, those are the DEA's red flags, and I think it's a good idea for you to have those on a chart. Uh, you can actually download them from the DEA's website. That's where I got them from, and uh, hang them around your pharmacy, and heavens, hang them out front, too, for your patients to see. Show them that you are paying attention. And finally, let's take a look at our own red flags, and I can't believe the DEA missed these. The biggest red flag... Uh, that flies at my store is when that patient comes in and wants to pay cash for a prescription. And we all know that is the biggest red flag. You have patients that don't want to pay cash for lisinopril and hydrochlorothiazide. They want that billed on their insurance card. For heaven's sakes, why would someone with insurance want to pay cash for OxyContin or Opana? So to me, that's the biggest flag. They come in, they want to pay cash. They'll say uh, their insurance isn't working. The first thing I'm going to do if I have insurance information, I'm going to transmit that claim and see what I can find out. Secondly, they want a specific brand. Uh, Qualitest works for me, but Malincrot doesn't. So if they want a specific brand or even more revolting, I want a specific NDC. I want the 357s for my hydrocodone. Um, that tells me I don't have that drug or any other hydrocodone in stock, and I'll give them their prescription back. I uh, don't like it when they use nicknames for their drugs. I need my zanies or my zany bars or I need my trammies. If they're using street lingo like that, that tells me that um, they're probably talking to some other people about their medication, and I'm not referring to other pharmacists. <laughs> If they offer an excuse, I really need this prescription filled for my clonazepam. Uh, I'm going out of town because my grandma is really sick and her dog just died. Her car broke down and I'm going to put a carburetor in it. And you look up the prescription and it's due to be filled. Uh, I see that a lot too. If they're just offering excuses before you even inquire. Another red flag for me is they never drop off the prescription. They talk excessively. They always refer to me as doctor. They tell me how smart I am. Have I lost weight? Am I good looking? And my gray hair looks distinguished. When they talk excessively and hand you all of those compliments, eh, that makes me pay attention a little bit more as well. I'd like to ask you now, type into the chat box, what are your red flags at your pharmacy? Other than the DEA red flags and uh, Professor Crackle's red flags, what puts up a, DE or a red flag for you? We know that drug diversion is a huge problem. So what can we do? And, and first of all, what we got to do is report incidents to the local attorney general, police department, or DEA office. If you have made all of the provisions that the prescription is indeed uh, not proper, uh, you need to make some reports. If it's forged, obviously, that's a police action. You need to take care of that immediately. And uh, there are times that uh, patients can be pretty slick at uh, 
life-altering prescriptions. Uh, we picked one lady up that was uh, doing oxycodone 5 milligrams, and she was changing it to oxycodone 15 milligrams. And it's not that I'm such an astute person that caught that. We filled that prescription seven times. Um, what had happened is her neighbor reported that she was doing it. So pay attention to your uh, people on the street as well. Uh, be patient. These investigations take time and sometimes it looks like the attorney general's office or the DEA agents are really spinning their wheels. It takes them a lot of time to put these investigations together. Clean up your own store first. Let patients know what rag red flags concern you and go out and inform them. And remember that 2% of your patients will give you 98% of your headaches. Use your expertise to get involved in local community groups. We all know what drug abuse and drug aversion looks like. We all have had a lot of experience with it. I know many of you listening to our presentation have had more experience than the 32 years that I have as a retail pharmacist. And I know a lot of you people work in real tough urban situations that maybe you haven't worked as long as I have, but you've seen a whole lot more of this. And we see that there are a lot of opportunities out there that maybe we can make a difference. So I'd like to leave you with some final thoughts and an opportunity for you to ask questions or share ideas. My final thoughts are, if it looks like a duck, if it swims like a duck, and it quacks like a duck, it's probably a duck. So let's use the instincts and the many years of experience that we all have as pharmacists to do our best to stop this drug abuse and all of these unnecessary deaths.